sports centre staff at a local sports centre witness a man collapse outside their sports centre. He's just been for his regular swim. As far as he knew, he's 54, completely fit and well. He's completely unresponsive. These staff are trained in basic life support. They call the emergency services immediately. One of them starts CPR straight away, as they've been trained to do, and the other goes to fetch the automated external defibrillator that is in the sports centre, as is commonplace in sports centres these days. They've started CPR. They've even delivered two shocks to this man's heart before the arrival of the first responding paramedic. They then help that paramedic with the resuscitation. They get this man's heart restarted. He remains deeply comatose, and he's taken to the local hospital. There he's taken straight away to the cardiac catheterization lab where a blocked coronary artery is found as the cause of his cardiac arrest. It's unblocked, stented, and he's moved to the intensive care unit, remaining deeply comatose, where he goes into multiple organ failure and requires organ support for several days. He eventually wakes up and after two or three more weeks in hospital, goes home to be with his wife, ostensibly normal, albeit with very slight cognitive impairment mild memory problems. This is a, a perfect example of the chain of survival. Every one of those links was intact, hence he survived. But the chain is only as strong as its weakest link, and it's important that all of those elements are there. Unfortunately, that story is not true for many others. There are 30,000 out-of-hospital cardiac arrests that are treated by the emergency medical services each year in England. And of those, about a quarter, 25%, will have their heart restarted or be alive when they are uh, moved to hospital. But only about 8% of the 30,000, that's about 2,400 people, will su survive to the discharge from hospital. It's a relatively small percentage, but it's a large number of people. We can and should do better than that. We know that bystander CPR will improve the chances of somebody surviving an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest by two or three times. There's plenty of data to support that. We know that in this country, at the moment, about 55% of out-of-hospital cardiac arrests will have bystander CPR. That's not bad by international standards, but it's not the best. So we can do better. One of the issues around bystander CPR is that what lay people are taught to do in terms of basic life support is not actually that basic. This combination sequence of remembering to call the emergency services, very important, starting chest compressions, but then also integrating that with rescue breaths, mouth to mouth breathing. It's not that easy to do. It's not that pleasant to do under these circumstances. And certainly we find therefore that a lot of people <laughs> either won't do it or they can't do it well. So one of the ways we can perhaps improve that bystander CPR rate is actually simplifying it. And one of the approaches to that is actually to, to teach people to do hands-only CPR, the chest compressions only. We think probably they're not quite as good as doing full CPR with mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, but they're not far off. And it's an awful lot better than no CPR at all. And because it's so simple, you can use huge public education campaigns, such as that from the British Heart Foundation a few years ago, headed up by Vinnie Jones. I'm sure many of you will have seen this on television. Basically getting people to do hands-only CPR. And it's even got the sort of idea that you can push hard and fast <laughs> to the rhythm of staying alive, the BG song. So a clear public message. And that can make a difference to how many people do CPR. In Copenhagen, they've shown remarkable data over the last 10 years to show improving survival rates. And if we look at all cardiac arrest rhythms, whether they be shockable or non-shockable, They've shown improvements from around about 4% up to about 10% in that 10-year period. But look at those that are in the shockable group, those that have a better chance of surviving. They've had a huge increase in survival rates in that group of patients. They've been very successful. Why have they been able to achieve that? The key thing is, if you look at this data here, is that their rate of bystander CPR has increased considerably over the last few years. And there are probably a number of reasons for that. One of them, very important, is that they, in, they made CPR training mandatory in schools about 10 years ago. In the following year, they made it mandatory. Before you passed a driving test, you had to undertake CPR training. These are great ways of actually 
getting that message out there. In, the, in Europe right now, there's a very strong ha campaign going on to try and get CPR training into the school's curriculum. This is the Kids Saving Lives program. Um, it's in several countries already, and it's hoped that we can persuade the World Health Organization to actually adopt this program and push it out globally. Certainly, there's been a strong campaign in the United Kingdom, led by the British Heart Foundation, the Resuscitation Council in the UK, to try and get CPR training into the schools. And it's been fronted up by Fabrice Mwamba, who many of you will remember, Bolton Wanderers football player, had a cardiac arrest on the pitch. He had resuscitation CPR for 78 minutes before his heart was restarted. He made a good neurological outcome. Sadly, not good enough to get back to foot professional football. But he's a good example. So we need to really bring in the public more to enhance our bystander CPR rates. We can use technology to help us do this. One of the things we can make use of is mobile phone GPS technology. So if somebody witnesses somebody collapse, their location, when, somebody, when a bystander actually phones into the emergency services, the location could be logged using mobile phone technology. But furthermore, you can use trained volunteers, trained responders who have uh, beforehand registered on a website to say they're prepared to take part in this. If they're within 500 meters of that cardiac arrest, they can be sent a text message on their phones so that they go to the right location. And these data here are from a randomized controlled trial showing that we can improve bystander CPR rates from about 48% to 62% by doing that. And we know improved bystander start, uh, CPR rates improve survival. But even better than that, we can use similar technology to actually be aware of where AEDs are in relation to that cardiac arrest. So public access defibrillators and potentially these volunteers could be sent to pick up a defibrillator first and take it to the, to the scene of the cardiac arrest. That is happening in several countries. Certainly the Dutch have already shown significant improvements in survival as a result of that. So use of technology to do that. Public access defibrillation programs are now widespread throughout the world. Some countries have probably adopted them better than others. The more AEDs that are out there, the higher the chance that we can get one rapidly to the, to the side of somebody who's had a collapse. This is a photograph taken from Tokyo, Japan, where they're big in their public access defibrillation programs. They're also big into vending machines. It's part of the Japanese culture. So the obvious thing is to install AEDs in vending machines because people know where they are. So it's sort of strategies like that that can make a big difference to survival. Technology in these devices, these AEDs, is improving all the time. They were already very clever. They will already be able to analyze a rhythm, tell the person what to do when it was applied. But now it gets even better than that because they're able to analyze the depth and the rate of chest compressions using sensors in these patches here, and they can feed back to the layperson whether they're pressing hard enough or fast enough or whatever. So they can improve the quality of CPR, even for somebody that's relatively untrained. That's what the public can do. So the public do a huge amount in potentially improving survival rates from cardiac arrest. But we have our professional responders as well. Here we have ambulance people who can do a whole range of interventions in these cardiac arrests. The challenge we face is working out which of those interventions actually makes a difference to survival and which of them perhaps just delays moving the patient to hospital for definitive care. One of the controversial areas and of course of interest to us as anaesthetists is the question of airway management. We've always thought that tracheal intubation was clearly the best way to go at cardiac arrest. But that's only true if you're highly skilled and experienced at tracheal intubation. Otherwise, it could be that you're simply interrupting chest compressions, possibly ending up with a tube that's misplaced in the wrong place, in the esophagus, for example, and causing more harm than benefit. So it may be that the use of superglottic airways that we're all used to using as part of our elective anesthesia all the time, it may be that the use of those devices by the emergency medical services results in better outcomes. And that's being studied in this country at the moment in a very large cluster randomized controlled trial involving about half the ambulance services in the UK, comparing the eye gel versus tracheal intubation with survival to discharge as the primary outcome. The other intervention that is controversial is drugs. It's generally standard practice to give all sorts of drugs during cardiac arrest, particularly adrenaline. 
Adrenaline has been regarded as absolutely mandatory almost for cardiac resuscitation since the early 60s when CPR was first described. And yet we have no high quality data to show that this will improve survival. We know that it will improve the rate that hearts are restarted, but long-term survival is unclear. And it might be that in fact, although we can improve return of spontaneous circulation rates, that there may be some impairment to the microcirculation of the brain that worsens long-term neurological outcome. And there's quite good evidence for that. So this is being studied in this country, in almost all the other ambulance services that aren't involved in the airways trial, they're doing a placebo-controlled trial, adrenaline, saline, blinded, randomised controlled <coughs> trial, which will finish in a year or two. So hopefully we'll have more information on which of those interventions improves outcome. Once we've got somebody's heart restarted, we now recognise that what happens to that patient after that makes a considerable difference to the quality of their eventual survival and whether they survive at all or not at the end of the day. And this final link in the chain of survival, the post-resuscitation care, is very important. We now have European guidelines indicating what we should be doing with these patients and there's a whole number of interventions that we will use to support the patient's organs hoping that they will survive. One of those of course is targeted temperature management, the concept that we rigidly control temperature somewhere between 33 and 36 <coughs> degrees for at least 24 hours. And there's some evidence that that actually improves neurological outcome. The other area where there's been a lot of de development is the concept of trying to predict which patients are going to eventually make a good outcome or a bad outcome. Traditionally, we would rely on just simply clinical examination of the patient to determine whether they were likely to make a good outcome. So if a deeply comatose person, maybe after two or three days after a cardiac arrest, makes no response, then in the past it might be that we actually withdrew care, believing that they had no chance of a good quality outcome. We now know that many of these patients that eventually make a good outcome take days and days to wake up. And so what we're now doing is using multimodal uh, treatments, investigations, to try and work out those patients that actually might still have a chance of a good recovery. So not just clinical examination. We're using electrophysiology, we're using blood test biomarkers, and we're using imaging such as CT and MRI. Putting that package all together and waiting and delaying the decision on whether we continue treatment or not. That in itself will make a big difference to outcome. It only just occurred to me when I was putting this, this talk together that what I've talked about in terms of these different links in the chain of survival has strong parallels with the British cycling team, the success of which has been put down to Dave Brailsford, and this whole idea of aggregation of marginal gains. That's what we're really talking about. To improve survival after cardiac arrest, we need to have marginal gains, marginal improvements at each of those steps in the resuscitation sequence. And only by doing that will we make a big difference and improve the number of people that will survive out of hospital cardiac arrest. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention.